Hello everyone, I am Demanded Kirby and welcome to my channel The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews under the deck tags. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on a commander from Assassin's Creed, Ezio Auditore de Firenze. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description, it'll really help out the channel at no extra cost to you. But the very best way you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. There are plenty of perks for being a patron such as early access to certain videos, exclusive deck text, gifts and more for as little as $1. You can also become a channel member for just 99 cents. Show off your support with a logo next to your name and exclusive emojis. Or you can always just support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing and sharing which also helps out a lot. I put out a video every Monday so you don't want to miss out. You can join my discord server for free if you want to join the commander tavern community. All pertinent links are down in the description. Alright let's get back to the episode. Ezio is a 3-2 human assassin with menace for 1 generic and 1 black. However, since he has a targeted ability requiring Wooburg to be paid, he has a Wooburg color identity. This triggers whenever he deals combat damage to a player with 10 or less life. When you do and pay the cost, that player loses the game. However, this ability is just a highly situational bonus. The real reason for building this deck is to have a 5 colored assassin lord in the command zone given his first non-keyworded ability. He gives assassin spells you cast free running for 2 black. This means that whenever he or any other assassin you control deals combat damage to a player, you can cast any assassin spell for just 2 black mana. This ability is so good with the really good assassins that have hefty mana cost. While assassin typo is the obvious route to building Ezio, I decided to take it a step further than that. The deck is more historic than assassin. For instance, every creature in the deck is legendary, even the assassins. Not only did this provide me with a nice restriction for deck building, but it also creates another avenue for how the deck operates since it can make the most out of so many legendary spells. But since assassins are what you're undoubtedly here for, let's see which ones I'm running. Basin ibn Ishaq is a very important one because he will almost always trigger thus becoming unblockable, and an unblockable assassin will trigger free running, helping us to cast as many assassins as we can afterwards. As a bonus, he also gets bigger each time he connects. Unblockability is so important that Access Tunnel, Rogue's Passage, and Minas Morgul Dark Fortress are included in order to guarantee an assassin or Ezio himself getting through. While these don't take up slots in the deck, it's always a tad risky to run colorless mana sources in 5 colored decks, but that won't really be a problem as we'll see further on. On the topic of unblockability, Sven Schwan, Lord of Wu is obviously included. While not an assassin himself, he can make all of our creatures essentially unblockable. This will obviously assist free running, but to also close out the game when we have the potential alpha strike. Also, he's quite flavorful here since he's a historical figure. Unblockability also helps with attack and combat damage triggers. Virtus the Veil connecting to an opponent will half their life after they take the hit, so keep that in mind, the correct order of doing things. While the deck doesn't include Grom, you can still shuffle your deck and fail to find if you wanted to shuffle it for some reason. For example, if after massively surveying with Desmond Miles and Lydia Fry. While the deck doesn't have a graveyard synergies, being able to mold the top of your library is still incredibly useful. Also, Desmond can become quite the beater in the mid to late game if we have a good board state. Lydia having built in unblockability is also good for assisting free running. That being said, if you see a ton of assassins when you're surveying deep through your library, you can send them to the graveyard instead if you had Patriarch's bidding in your hand. That's an epic power move dumping a ton of assassins with surveil and then reanimating them afterwards. Just beware the graveyard hate. Mari the Killing Quill, Massacre Girl, Known Killer, Queen Marquesa, Sira the Golden Sting and Ezio Blade of Vengeance on the hand provide actual card advantage by drawing us cards. Granted, some require more hoops to jump through than others, but the deck has a non-synergistic card advantage which we'll see later on. Mari is great because she also exiles killed creatures, interrupting graveyard strategies but also gives us the potential of drawing cards and creating treasures which we'll get to in a moment. Massacre Girl giving our creatures wither helps with making our smaller creatures more dangerous. Her card draw ability is a bit situational but still attainable. In fact, let me make a parenthesis here to talk about some of the spicy tech in the deck. Unholy Citadel. Almost all of the legendary creatures in the deck are black. If they all had a banding, that means that we can do some epic combat tricks. We can choose how blockers deal their damage to our band and we can also choose how attackers deal damage to our blockers. Meaning that we can not only nullify trample, but we can also spread the damage around blocking a much larger creature to kill it with the potential of not losing any of our own creatures. Combined with Massacre Girl, if we're giving them minus one minus one counters, then we can definitely kill them or gravely weaken them while losing a minimal amount of our own creatures. I love banding, but if this is too complicated for you, you can obviously opt out of running this. If you do want to run it, keep in mind that it does not tap for mana on its own, so do not consider it as a landslot. 
Marquesa giving us the monarchy is a good way to draw cards. However, if we don't have it, we create assassins, which is obviously a huge bonus for this deck. So regardless of our crown situation, we can make the most of it. Syrah has Flying and Haste, which can help us trigger free running when she enters the battlefield. She has a similar card advantage trigger to Mari in that it requires a challenging setup, but it's relatively viable nonetheless, and fun too. Saving the best for last, it's Ezio. Obviously, he's the best of these since we draw a card whenever an assassin we control deals combat damage to a player. Notice this trigger doesn't have any kind of restriction, so we can draw a card per assassin dealing combat damage regardless of how many, how few, number of opponents hit, etc. Reliquary Tower is included just in case you do have a massive hand. Since our assassins should be very cheap to cast, we can have an explosive turn if we manage to dump our hand onto the battlefield. This is the only limitless hand sized card in the deck, though since it technically doesn't take up a spell slot. Vraska the Silencer, Olivia Opulent Outlaw, and Edward Kenway help us with mana acceleration in the form of treasure tokens. Vraska is quite interesting though because the treasure token will still have the abilities the creature did, so we don't have to sacrifice it if it's a good creature. For example, if it were a Seedborn Muse or something like that, we could just keep it as is to make the most of it. Olivia also gives us the potential of pumping our creatures for 3 generic and 2 treasures. 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters is nothing to scoff at, with the sorcery speed being the only drawback. We can't make the most of Edward due to the deck not running any vehicles. That being said, the video before this one showcases him as a commander in his own right. You can check it out in the link above if you haven't already and are interested in seeing him as a vehicle and pirate lord commander. On the topic of pumping our creatures, Achilles Davenport, Arno Dorian, Ramsey's Assassin Lord, Bayek of Siwa, and Morophon the Boundless do just that. Achilles has built in free running which is great, a 2 mana anthem is never a bad thing. Arno has this guys which makes him more expensive in the long run, but he does give a significant attack boost. Ramses also gives plus 1 plus 1 to our assassins but is even more brutal than that since we have the potential of winning the entire game just by eliminating a single player. You could be cruel and headhunt the player most behind or reclaim the game as a prize for eliminating the biggest threat. Bayek doesn't pump per se but giving our historic creatures double strike doing our turn is quite significant. For one thing, if they had a death touch, they'll kill whatever blocks them without worry of dying in combat. Two, if they had any combat damage triggers, it'll trigger twice once they connect. And since the deck only has legendary creatures, this matters not just for the 22 assassins in the deck, but every other creature as well. As for Morophon, you need to choose assassin when it enters the battlefield in order to get the plus one plus one boost. However, since it has changeling, you can cast this for just 2 black mana instead of 7 generic mana thanks to free running. Then, once it's in play, your free running assassin spells only cost 1 black mana to cast since Morophon reduces their casting costs by Wooburg. This is easily one of the best assassins in the deck when it comes to synergy with the commander. Another one along that vein is Kirik, son of Yawgmoth. While not an assassin himself, since Ezio gives our assassin spells a free running cost of 2 black mana, we could choose to cast them for free if we wanted to by simply paying 4 life thanks to Kirik. Combined with Morophon, we just have to pay 2 life and get them that way for free. Relic of Legends and We Ride at Dawn also work with Ezio and even better when we also have Morphon. If we have a handful of assassins that we tap a legendary creature to produce the black mana needed to free run one of them. Once it's in play, we can tap it to free run cast the next one, essentially emptying our hand of assassins. The enchantment can be used in the same way but the legendary creature would have to also be black in order to pay the free running cost. Fortunately, since all creatures in my deck are legendary, the enchantment does even more work here. This is what I was talking about earlier when I first thought of this deck. I could have simply built it with all the best assassins and typo synergies, but making it also historic gave me access to a ton more useful and spicy tech. Cabal Coffers and Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth are still obviously included in the deck though. They need to be if our assassin spells cost 2 black mana to cast thanks to 3 running. So the deck does have plenty of ways to get these assassins out of our hands and onto the battlefield even if the historic synergies are the best and most interesting ways of going about it. Layla Hassan also provides historic synergies all while being an assassin, checking off both boxes for this deck. We're able to recover any historic card from our graveyard whenever one or more assassins smack an opponent. Due to the wording of the trigger, we can get a maximum of 3 historic cards back, but that's fine enough. Rakdos joins up also helps us recover when it enters, however that's just a bonus. This legendary enchantment is amazing because it makes opponents very wary of wiping the board, especially when we have a huge one. With enchantments being difficult to remove in certain colors, it makes it even harder. Why? Because if our legendary creatures, which are all of them, die, it deals damage equal to that creature's power to an opponent. So you can essentially punish whoever wiped your board by burning them to death. Same with our creatures dying in combat by blocking or being blocked. This card is so good in this deck precisely because I built it with only legendary creatures. 
Etrada Deadly Fugitive and IF Alexandria help our board state grow by creating creatures. Etrada does so by cloaking the top card of the defending player's library. Best of all, there's no restriction on how often this can trigger. So if our creatures are unblockable, we get a ton of face down tutus afterwards. Best of all, if the cloaked card is a high CMC creature or other spell, we can pay 4 mana to turn it face up instead of paying its mana cost. So good. Aya creates 1-1 one, one assassins with menace whenever a historic creature deals combat damage to a player, which is going to be all of our creatures. She definitely helps fill our board too. Thraxan Mundar, last but not least, is the final assassin in the deck. While its interaction on a body, don't overlook a 6-6 six, six hasty dude that also gets bigger each time a creature is sacrificed. Especially if we can get him early game for just 2 black mana thanks to free running. The historic aspect of this deck can also help with card advantage. We can run out of gas fairly quickly if we're easily dumping our assassins onto the battlefield. Reki, the history of Kamigawa, Joy by the Light Captain, and Shanid, Sleeper Scourge help with just that. There are 33 legendary permanents in this deck, so these cards will trigger plenty of times, drawing us a ton of cards in any given time. However, I have to give a huge special mention to Joda the Unifier and how he works with this deck. Even if we cast an assassin spell for just 2 black mana, that's not its mana value. So let's say we cast Thraxamundar for just 2 black mana. Joda is going to see us casting a 7 mana value legendary spell from our hand, so we can pseudo cascade into a legendary non-land spell for 6 or less mana. We can essentially get an insane amount of value from this. Since we're casting those cards, it'll also trigger the previously shown cards that trigger off of casting legendary spells. Joda is insanity in this deck. Guardian Project and Kindred Discovery are also included and make it even more busted. Kindred Discovery will only trigger off of Assassins, but that's fine because it'll also trigger off of Assassins attacking drawing us an even larger amount of cards, especially with the deck creating assassin tokens. When combined with any of the previous effects, we'll be diving through our library. Vraska joins up will also draw us cards but when legendary creatures deal combat damage to a player. Since all of our creatures are legendary, you get the gist of it. However, this 2 mana legendary enchantment also puts a death touch counter on all of our creatures when it enters the battlefield. If our creatures also had first strike or double strike, then they'll be even deadlier. Kolvori, God of Kinship, also provides synergistic card advantage since we can pay 2 and tap her to filter the top 6 cards of our library for a legendary creature card. With 28 legendary creatures in the library, this will almost always get us at least one creature each time. As a bonus, she also becomes a 6-6 fairly easily. Since her backside is basically never used here, we don't have to worry about keeping track of which side to cast. The Ring Goes South provides massive mana acceleration the more legendary creatures we have in play. While this might seem win more, it's not just limited to basic lands or anything like that. So even if we control just 4 legendary creatures, it pays for itself while also getting us any land we reveal. The Ring also tempts us, which further helps even if it's just in the first level, since it makes the Ring Bearer not be blockable by creatures with greater power, which is another form of evasion which is even more relevant for this deck. Desynchronization is also amazing here because we're bouncing most of the creatures on the board except for ours. Well, we do lose any face down and token creatures, but we're still keeping our actual creatures in play. Since this is an instant, we can cast this in response to someone alpha striking us, or at the end of the opponent's turn before ours for our own alpha strike. This card is just amazing in this particular deck. Same with Raise the Palisade and Kindred Dominance. While these aren't tied to the historic aspect of the deck, they still synergize with the typal nature of the deck. Like desynchronization, these have the potential of dealing with almost the entire board except for most of ours. The deck is still running non-synergistic ways of drawing cards, accelerating mana, and interacting with the board, as it and every other commander deck should. Black Market Connections and Phyrexian Arena provide sufficient card advantage. The first one has the added bonus of also providing treasure tokens and shapeshifters with changeling, which would be yet another source of assassin tokens. You can also swap the arena for Ristic Study if you want to be more efficient. But I am so tired of seeing that card put in every single deck that I have since refrained from playing them in any of my own decks. An offer you can't refuse, Swan Song Negate and Anguish Unmaking for single target removal along with Guffrey Wright's History, Decimate, Unexplained Absence, Wind Grace's Judgment and Casualties of War for multiple single target removal and overloading Cyclonic Rift as the best possible board wipe. Since the deck is 5 colored you can include whatever interaction suite you want. I just chose these because they're tried and true plus can manage almost anything on the board or being cast, especially anything that can irk us. Heroic Intervention and Teferi's Protection are included just for that. The deck can still somewhat rebuild with Patriarch's building and whatnot, but it's always better to prevent than to solve. Lightning Greaves, Swift of Boots, Champion's Helm and Mithril Coat help protect our key creatures. While the deck can function without its commander, and even then he's incredibly easy to cast multiple times in a game, there are plenty of powerful creatures that are worth protecting. 
Far seek nature's lore, three visits into the north and rampant growth are naturally included in order to accelerate our mana. Keep in mind that artifact based mana acceleration is incredibly weak. While the deck is 5 colored we can still make the most of these, especially since the deck is running all 10 snow duels and all 10 tricycle lands. My favorite ramp trifecta spells can essentially get any of these 20, with Into the North getting the first 10 as well as any of these single copies of snow covered basics in the deck. Rampant Growth would thus then be able to get any of those 5 if it came down to it, especially if you're facing against Blood Moon type effects or if opponents play abilities that let you tutor for basics. The deck is still running the following 4 fetch lands. Since black mana is the most important color for Ezio's free running ability, these can fe all fetch for a swamp type land. Granted, make sure you get a triome with these in order to also help fix your colors. Last but not least is Soul Ring, but that's to be expected. You can never go wrong with this one, so why not? This brew is just an idea of how to build around Ezio Aritore de Ferense. As previously mentioned, you can build him as a purely assassin type of commander, but I decided to make it a bit spicier by making this a historic deck as well. And I absolutely love how it turned out. Hopefully you also get some ideas on how to build your own version. So if you're interested in the deck list of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link, that also helps out the channel. I also want to thank any channel members, your membership is greatly appreciated. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am the Meded Kirby and happy brewing.